when the avatars are having space sex and they like connected with the earth, I feel like that would be like a Klingon aphrodisiac as well. So yeah, I would totally do that. You could maybe share orgasms. That would be kind of cool. Do they ever address this in the new generation? Gene, does Captain <laughs> Picard ever? Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked ass. Welcome back to Chat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we love and growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why do they mean movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you even remember what Blockbuster Video was? If you answered yes and this is the podcast for you, I'm one of your three co-hosts, Roger Roper. And alongside me are my two co-hosts, Big D, Dick Hebert. Good morning. And Gene Con Lions. I'm afraid it's even harder than you think, Doctor. <laughs> God. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. Each week, the audience selects from six movie choices that we then break out a race car VHS tape rewinder and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes at the end of the podcast. Three of us will provide you, the audience, with a number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. You can also check out our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, and coming soon, Watchmen. That being said, we're having an, a, a reverse episode where usually the time zones work in our favor, Gene, but uh, not today because we are up at the ass crack of dawn to record this episode. That's right. I can't remember the last time I was awake before 6 a.m., uh, <laughs> but I did get to hear everybody's morning vocalizations. That was really exciting. Uh, I got to hear your uh, deflating after a night of a good night's sleep as you started your day with a diet Coke and then had to release it promptly into the atmosphere. Yeah, this is nice. Normally I'm the one who's up at like midnight recording and you guys are like, Oh, it's nine o'clock. What am I going to do with the rest of the evening? This morning I got up, you know, nice eight o'clock. It's nine o'clock. Now this is, I'm full of energy. This is wonderful. We should do this more often. Yeah. Good for you. Well, big D we are rounding out our, uh, commissions uh from the summer we've got we've we've been so fortunate to have just great listeners and wanting to buy those fast passes so they can hear their favorite movies and to this episode is no different because we are doing um something we're, we're we're going where no podcast has gone before yeah one of our listeners john clyburn he was nice enough to commission a movie and i'm shocked that this is the first time that we've delved into the realm of star trek we've done one star wars We've done a few sci-fi, but I'm just shocked it took this long, 120 plus movies in. And John said, why don't you guys do the 1982, some say best Star Trek movie around, The Wrath of Khan? Yeah, I, um, I'm admittedly, I watched all the Star Trek movies as a kid, but I, I didn't really know, like just off the top of my head, I don't know how to rank these movies like I do with Star Wars. But when I, I put a tweet out on the Twitterverse, and you're right, it was confirmed. Most people think this movie is the best of the bunch, especially of the first six trilogy, not counting the next generation or even the reboots. Oh, I totally agree. I think this is the one that's memorable. It's got the the villain. It was early enough on that people can identify. Because after that, we were trying to go through, hey, what are the other ones? And we're like, uh, which one is <laughs> Nemesis? We're like, which one is Beyond? <laughs> We're like, uh, uh, the search for Spock, okay, that was three, but Generations, what, what the fuck was the Undiscovered Country, <laughs> right. Insurrection? It's hard to tell them apart, but this one, there is no doubt, uh, this one had an iconic villain, and I think that's probably what John wanted to hear. Well, as part of our commission process, we always ask why they would send in their hard-end dollars to chat the movies uh, via Venmo or our PayPal account along side that commission we asked for a email and uh john was no different he did send us a uh a starfleet communication isn't that right gene that's right raj uh, john writes i would love to hear you review star trek 2 the wrath of khan my father and i didn't have much in common when i was growing up one of the few things we did enjoy together was watching and discussing star trek i remember spending time being immersed in various types of sci-fi with him and in my opinion, Star Trek is the king of sci-fi. 
I look forward to listening to the tearing down of a classic. I'm entertained by your podcast, especially when Carrie is on. For your information, your podcast is the only thing that got me through the dumpster fire that was season eight of Game of Thrones. Keep up the amazing work. And that comes from John Clyburn. Well, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan is a 1982 American science fiction film featuring Admiral James T. Kirk, played by William Shatner and the crew of the Starship USS Enterprise facing off against the genetically engineered tyrant Khan Noonien Singh, played by Ricardo Montalban. When Khan escapes from a 15-year exile to exact revenge on Kirk, the crew of the Enterprise must stop him from acquiring a powerful terraforming device named Genesis. The film is the beginning of a story arc that continues with Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, and concludes with the film Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. After the lackluster critical response to 1979 Star Trek The Motion Picture series, creator Gene Roddenberry was forced out of the sequel's production, and director Nicholas Meyer's fresh approach evoked a swashbuckling atmosphere of the original series, a theme reinforced by James Horner's musical score. The production team used various cost-cutting techniques to keep within budget, including utilizing miniature models from past projects and reusing sets, effects footage, and costumes from the first film among the film's technical achievements is being the first feature film to contain a sequence created entirely by computer generated graphics. The wrath of Khan was a box office success as a result, earning $97 million, the equivalent of $252 million in today's dollars. It also set a world record for the highest first day box office gross critical reaction to the film was also positive. Reviewers highlighted Khan's character, the film's pacing, and the character interactions as strong elements. Negative reactions, however, focused on the weak special effects and some of the acting. The Wrath of Khan is considered, as we mentioned, by many to be the best film in the Star Trek series and is often credited with renewing substantial interest in the franchise. Before we dive into the review and give you our opinion, however, we always ask, where were you? When you first saw Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, we'll start with you, Big D. Uh, So growing up, I've talked about it before. uh, My parents, they have a house up in the mountains of New York outside Woodstock. It was originally built by my grandparents in like 1912. So it was an old cabin. And then when I was about five or six, my parents decided, hey, we're going to renovate it. So for five years... Every Friday, we would pack in the car, drive two hours up there, and stay in a house that had no TV, no heat. They were redoing everything. So they gutted the inside of the house. So for five years, there was no entertainment on the weekends. And the only mall that was close was the Hudson Valley Mall, which opened the year before this movie, 1981. It had a J.C. Penney, it had a Kmart, and it had a Hoyt Six Green Theater. This was like an oasis because we had nothing up there. I mean, it was like the old days. Like you play with sticks outside. There was nothing to do. So when this movie came out, I remember my parents loaded us up into the station wagon. They said, we're going to go out to Kingston, the big city, and we're going to watch this movie. And I sat there. It was absolutely amazing for the time. And I don't know if I loved it because the movie or is just to get out of the woods. But this was a memorable moment as a family sitting down and watching a movie. Gene, as we learned on Galaxy Quest, you are a fan of Star Trek overall, and you're, of the three of us, kind of versed in the Star Trek lore. So you've seen Star Trek II, The the Wrath of Khan, I imagine. Funny you should ask, Raj. So I've seen all of the Next Generation episodes, and I think all the original series. I didn't really get into Deep Space Nine or Voyager, but... A few years back when all the Star Trek movies finally came on to streaming services, I noticed that the entire catalog was there and I was like, now's my chance, man. I'm going to watch them all. Like just take a couple weekends and and really get all this under my belt. And I started with the original Star Trek, the motion picture, the 1979 Star Trek, the motion picture. And I immediately fell asleep. And I tried again and I fell asleep again. And this was actually my first time staying awake through any of the original Star Trek movies. And it's really weird, but I I just, they're so slow and we'll get into that a little bit in the podcast. It's probably sacrilege, but like I actually enjoyed the newer reboot movies much more than this string of films. 
Yeah, well, I had no idea about it at the time. I was too young to see it in theaters like Big D was, but I definitely watched this a lot on HBO at my grandparents' house as a kid. This was before, you know, VHS was as widely available as it is. Um, and I know this because a young Kirsty Alley is my totem, is my thing that as a is a human, if I visit Westworld or some sort of science fiction theme park, she's that thing that keeps bringing me back. She's my top that spins, if you will. So, yeah, no, I've seen this movie a lot, but it's been a while since I saw it all together. I was also a big fan of Fantasy Island. Yeah. Like that was yeah. another thing that I would watch as a as a kid at uh, my grandparents' house. So, anytime Ricardo Montalban was on, like uh, my grandfather was Cuban, so I guess he still is, right? I mean, even though he passed <laughs> say away, what he's is. still yeah, he's still Cuban. So there was a lot of, you know, Spanish influence in my house, and so he really liked Ricardo Montalban. So, uh yeah, this movie was always on as a kid. It it was re- really strange. This is before you know, HBO had content, right? This was just, they would just play the same movie over and over and over again. Kids today don't know that. They don't know that. They don't know music videos. And also HBO used to turn off at night. It wasn't 24 hours a day. That's right. It wasn't. Yeah. Now it just turns off in the eighth season of a hit series. (laughs) These damn kids are spoiled today. (laughs) With that being said, Big D, play the trailer. Beyond the Darkness. Beyond the human evolution is Khan, a genetically superior tyrant, exiled to a barren planet, banished by a starship commander he is destined to destroy. Left for dead, he has survived. I will chase him round the moons of Nibia and round the Antares maelstrom and round Perdition's flames before. Give him up. There she is. There she is. Shoot collapsing, Captain. Not enough against their shields. The base is stubborn. Scotty, I need warp speed in three minutes or we're all dead. I've done far worse than kill you. I've hurt you. And I wish to go on hurting you. I shall leave you as you left me. Marooned for all eternity. Buried alive. At the end of the universe lies the beginning of vengeance. Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. In the year 2285, Admiral James T. Kirk oversees a simulator session of Captain Spock's trainees. In the simulation, Lieutenant Savick commands the starship Enterprise on a rescue mission to save the crew of the damaged ship Kobayashi Maru, but is attacked by Klingon cruisers and critically damaged. The simulation is a no-win scenario designed to test the character of Starfleet officers, but later, Dr. McCoy joins Kirk on his birthday. Seeing Kirk in low spirits, the doctor advises Kirk to get a new command and not grow old behind a desk. You know, guys, with a lot of the reboots we've had lately and prequels and sequels and basically Hollywood making, you know, all these movies that are derivative of earlier movies, the term has come up often on podcasts and in blogs about fan service, right? Oh, they're just doing Mm -hmm. fan service. Star Wars was just doing fan service when they brought characters, you know, back in and, oh, it's The Last Jedi and, oh, you know, we're going to have CGI versions, uh, Princess Leia. Fan service is not a new thing. And this movie really made me realize that. Uh, we open the scene up and it's like, all oh, your favorites are right here. Oh, look, <laughs> it's Kirk being Kirk. It's Spock being Spock. And I'm like, why are they all on a bridge? Who is this lady? And then I realized it's a simulation. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. The legendary crew of the Enterprise, they're all like, let's get together for these new trainees. Like they got nothing better to do. And then I realized in the writing room, they're like, oh, let's shock the audience and make them think that all the characters die really early in this movie. And they're going to be, you know, gasping because, again, this is 82. They don't have like, 
billions of trailers before the movie comes out. You can't go online and just look up, you know, on, on YouTube. Um, but it just doesn't seem reasonable in world. Like I get what they were trying to do and shocking the audience. But again, part of this podcast is looking back and going, does this make sense? Does it even make sense for the movie? Uh, and it doesn't. And all I could think was, fuck, everyone in this movie looks so ancient. The the bridge simulation, it basically looks like a retirement home with like a couple of kids there just to take care of the crew, you know? Okay, all right, all right, Spock, you just sit down, you know, have your oats. The the issue is not so much with the age of the characters, because outside of Leonard Nemo, who I guess just always looked older, I think the the crew looks pretty good here. Like George Takei looks young and spry. I think William Shatner is still in shape. He hadn't grown that that TJ Hooker dad bod yet. I thought he looked pretty decent. Bones looks like if he touched a single sheet of paper, it would split him from head to foot. <laughs> just bleed out. But that's yeah, bones. Paper thin skin. We just watched <laughs> E.T. That was what it brought to mind. It looks like a group of people meeting on the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. It looks like everybody has had work. Yeah, they're skinny. They're in shape. But their faces, you could tell, are about to crack. There definitely was. You could tell they were old and trying to hold on. Yeah. Well, I didn't have so much of a problem with the age, maybe as Gene did, as I had with... This is a training simulation in the year 2285 with a starship with shields like uh, have damage like that like is that what they plan for well th that was a question i wanted to ask gene it, it didn't make much sense okay so during the simulation first of all there's no it's not like there's a hologram this is where everybody's like, hey let's do a simulation and when the the console blows up people fall down they pretend like they're dead they're they're acting but gene i don't get it during the simulation, the ship takes four hits. Maybe it's a mix of photons and lasers. It destroys the entire ship. The bridge, everyone is dead. But in the real show, it seems like a, a starship can take maybe 15 hits. It then kind of sputters off. They redirect power to auxiliary. Everybody gets back up. They hit again. Why in this simulation was a ship destroyed by four when in the show it takes at least 20? I think that's part of the Kobayashi Maru. They were like, all right, it's going to be a no-win situation. And they're like, well, how can you make that happen? They're like, uh, any hit is going to kill everybody on the deck. That's just how it happens. But it is weird that like you can only assume that worse things are happening on the rest of a ship. Because whenever they get hit, the bridge is like the first thing where people start exploding. And you're like, what's uh, happening on the rest of the ship? Is there a part uh, of the ship where there's just nothing happening? Right. Like, if you go back into, like, I don't know, the, the storage rooms, they're just people just chilling. No, it's 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 always the bridge and the engine room because yeah. they, they got to call down to Scotty and Scotty's going to say, I don't know, Captain, I've given her all she's got. She can't take much more. So why does the United Federation of Planets spend so much on offensive weapons, but nothing on defense, at least in Star Wars, when you see battles, they get hit and they shake around and, you know, they have to go fix some stuff here. You get hit. Everything is fucking devastating. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Gene, but isn't Starfleet, even though it's considered the militaristic arm of the United Federation of Planets, the starships are more for exploration purposes, even though they do have photon torpedoes and phasers, right? Like they're, aren't they essentially, isn't the Enterprise really more of a, a peacekeeping vessel? Yeah, the Enterprise is the flagship of the fleet. So it's basically, you know, it's, it's meant for multi-purpose. It addresses the most significant missions, but like, yeah, if you watch like other Star Trek movies and episodes, you'll see that when they're like, when they're in war, it's a whole different situation. I mean, like different kinds of ships, different kind of armament. I just think it's funny that Big D's even asking this question and not looking at like <laughs> the current military. You see guys running around with a lot of armor, Big D. Offense is the way to win. We know that. No, I understand, but there's a difference. These All these offensive weapons seem a bit OP. I figure they would have had a little better defense. So before this movie, Big D, did you know what the Kobayashi Maru was? I'm embarrassed to say when they said Kobayashi Maru, I immediately knew what it was because Gene had talked about it. So when they said it, I was like, oh, fuck, it's a simulation. It's only because of my proximity to Gene Lyons. And what's sad about that is that I hadn't seen Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. I just already knew what a Kobayashi Maru was. So that was, again, but I think that speaks to this movie that it's kind of ubiquitous in culture. Like if you yell out Khan, even if people haven't seen Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, they get the general sentiment. 
And I think, you know, Star Trek's had that impact on, on culture overall, but it was, it, it just kind of made me feel ultra nerdy to be like, oh yeah, I actually use that in common parlance and uh, didn't even know it was from this movie. Great. But how the fuck is this a no-win situation? I don't get it. You know what? You're bound by the treaty. If you venture into the neutral zone, you're going to start a war. I'm sorry. The, the proper thing to do, they're testing you, is to follow orders, stay outside. Yes, you're going to have 80 crew and whatever die, but you have no option. I don't see why this is such a big dilemma. Because that's how they wrote it to be. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's how Spock wrote it to be. And the, And I know it from... The Star Trek reboot, the J.J. Abrams 2009, before I Kobayashi Maru was not in my in my lexicon. But the one thing that you guys talked about was the introduction of new characters. And for me, the the one that always makes me remember that this is Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan was the young Kirstie Alley. I got to ask, did you guys ever find this is 82? Did you ever find this young Kirstie Alley hot? She's playing Savik in this, which I guess she's like half Romulan, half Vulcan. I think she's attractive in this movie. Like as soon as she made her appearance on the bridge, I was like, oh, is that Kirstie Alley? And I'm like, she looks Mm -hmm. good because my previous exposure to her really started at Cheers. And I remember Mm -hmm. as a kid on Cheers, like they would present her as sexy, but I just Mm -hmm. thought she looked like all my friend's moms. Again, Mm -hmm. listen, I've gotten in trouble before on this podcast. I want to take a second here. Moms, I'm not (laughs) saying you're not sexy. I'm saying when I was a child, I was not attracted (laughs) to my friend's moms except for you lola do you do you think kirstie alley joined scientology as a part of this movie she's like i i was in a sci-fi movie i know this religion she just wears the ears all the time (laughs) do you think they like because they used to like just sit on the sidewalks right do you think like she forgot to take them off she's like it's been a long day of shooting i'm gonna leave these on she's walking down the streets of you know hollywood boulevard and uh that's where scientologists hang out if you go to los angeles avoid people trying to get you into their uh, souvenir shops and people trying to get you to do the, um, what do they call it, Gene? The electropsychometer. It's electropsychometer. Um, it is called auditing. They auditing. audit you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Auditing. That's what they call it. Yeah. So they see her ears and they're like, you know what? She'd be perfect for us. Scientology. No, I think I would want to sit down and I would do an audit. I think it'd be fun. No, you don't. You don't. Yes. Ask, come on. You, you think you want to there. You know how many people have been tricked into that? They're like, mm, I can <laughs> oh, I handle it. And second. then six years later, they're part of part of the sea org. They're like, you look like you can sustain yourself. You're a former military man. Do you know that our leader, Ron L. Hubbard was also in the military? Yes. So listen, as we go forward here, I think we're going to try to answer some of the differences between Star Wars and Star Trek, because there's always been a battle of which is better. And right off the bat, we just did last week E.T., and it's got that John Williams score that really just pulls from the heart. And as this movie is going, I'm immediately thinking how much better this would have been with a John Williams score. I mean, James Horner, he's he's capable, but it. There was nothing special about it. It more highlighted, oh, we're in space. But never did I feel an emotional <laughs> pull to anything that was going on, whether it was some of the tension, some of the, the battle scenes. I think with a John Williams score, this movie might have been twice as good. It, it was very slow and deliberate. And I wonder if that is one of the differences that I guess growing up, people who were fans of Star Trek would constantly hold over fans of Star Wars like myself and Big D is like, well, it's supposed to be slow. It's supposed to be more about the story and the exploration versus Star Wars, which is all laser swords and smuggling. If you if you think that in the beginning of this movie, they're already smuggling illegal items from space, which is kind of why I like Bones, because Bones is always the one who's like, hey, you know, I I, I got a guy uh, who uh, brings it across the border for me, some Romulan ale, only for medicinal purposes. Also, at one point, you infer that maybe Bones has given Kirk Klingon aphrodisiacs. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, like maybe that's why Kirk was always kissing the green women. It's because he was all hopped up on Klingon aphrodisiacs. But let me ask you this. What would you rather do? Would you rather do Romulan ale or would you rather do a fucking Klingon aphrodisiac? Uh, Klingon aphrodisiac. Oh, 100%. What about you? I wouldn't want something that's going to make me trip out, but I imagine that a Klingon aphrodisiac would make you have some like kinetic bond 
So yeah. as you're having mm-hmm. sex, it would be this sharing of feelings. That could sound good, but I, I don't want to trip out. I got a small child I have to take care of. I think that would be like um, when the avatar is plugged in with the the the, the, the tree the tree or whatever, like when, yeah. um, when they the avatars are having space sex or, and then they like connected with the earth. I feel like that would be like a Klingon aphrodisiac as well. So yeah, I would totally do that. You could maybe share orgasms. That'd be kind of cool. Do they ever address this in the new generation? Gene does captain <laughs> Picard ever. <laughs> was it, he addicted to Romulan ale. Wasn't that his vice? <laughs> like he's like, I, I can't drink it. No, that was, that was tea. That was Earl gray tea. No. All right. Well, meanwhile, the Starship Reliant is on a mission to search for a lifeless planet to test the Genesis device, a technology designed to reorganize dead matter into habitable worlds. Reliant officers Commander Pavel Chekhov and Captain Clark Terrell beam down to evaluate a planet they believe to be SETI Alpha 6. Once there, they are captured by the genetically engineered tyrant Khan Noonan Singh, and Khan blames Kirk for the death of his wife and plans revenge. He implants Chekhov and Terrell with indigenous eel larvae that render them susceptible to mind control and uses them to capture Reliant. Learning of the Genesis device, Khan attacks Space Station Regula 1, where the device is being developed by Kirk's former lover, Dr. Carol Marcus, and their son, David. So if at this point you're watching Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and you have no idea what the fuck is going on with Khan, you're not alone. The filmmakers are expecting the audience to remember an episode from 15 years prior. So in 1967, there was a Star Trek episode called Space Seed. And you need to have kind of seen that to understand, appreciate uh, the con reveal. So basically, the way it works is Ricardo Montalban was also in that episode. So this is him reprising a role from 15 years prior and looking fabulous while doing it. But during the 1990s on Earth, Khan controlled more than a quarter of the earth during this thing called the eugenics wars, or basically you had people who were bioengineered and genetically engineered to be superior in both strength and intelligence. And he was deposed by earthlings and escaped on the sleeper ship called the SS Botany Bay. And then this ship is out there, Kirk and the crew discover him. Uh, and he and Khan decides, you know, he's still got aspirations. So he wants to take over the enterprise and things devolve. And eventually Kirk like knocks his ass out and then they have a vote. And they decide what to do with Khan. And they're like, okay, we're going to exile him to this planet, SETI Alpha 5. And then in this movie, we find out that SETI Alpha 6, which was next door to 5, blew up. And then it rendered SETI Alpha 5 uninhabitable. And the way their orbit shifted made the, you know, the crew of the Reliant confused about which planet they were on. Uh, it was just, it's just, it's amazing that like they depended on the audience to have the kind of attention span and knowledge of the show <laughs> to remember all this shit. Because if you don't, when you see Khan, like when he does that reveal and he takes his wrappings off his face, you're like, okay. <laughs> but I can, I can picture the theater. I don't remember that. If there was like two or three people in the theater who were like, yeah, woo! And the rest of us looked around like, okay, what just happened? Who is that? Well, this is something that you see like in Marvel movies today, right? Where they introduce a character and you're like, oh my God, that's a Black Panther or, oh, that's a little wink, wink, nod, nod to the audience. And I think Star Trek was one of those series that relied on the audience's knowledge. Like it didn't feel the need to have an entire scene where they're explaining who this character was because they assume that you're fans of the series and fans of the series will get it. And this is just, this is for you guys, right? This is for those people who are in the know, but regardless of that, this is what star Trek, I guess was expecting the eugenics wars to look like of people of middle Eastern and and Asian descent, because that's where that's the quarter of the population that Khan in the star Trek canon, that's where he ruled. And so are we to believe that everyone is supposed to look like they're, doing apocalyptic jazzercise because Ricardo Montalban, he's like wearing this weird jacket that comes all the way down to his, to his belly button. And he's got like some rolled up headbands and everyone's kind of wearing their, they kind of look like a, like Mad Max beyond the Thunderdome, but he's also strategically hiding his nipples like JLo on stage at the Emmys. So what's going on there? As I was watching this movie, I was like, did he have work done on his chest? Are those implants? Like, what is going on there? (laughs) And it turns out that the costume designer actually saw his physique and was like, oh, yeah, we're going to emphasize that chest. That's his actual chest, which is terrifying. Because he's not a young man in this movie, but he looks fantastic. Well, we talked about Fantasy Island. You guys watched Fantasy Island as much as I did, right? Oh, yeah. I'm embarrassed to say I remember this was on back to back with the love boat. 
Mm-hmm. And, I, mm-hmm. and I think I watched both of them. Yeah, a hundred percent. How much do you think Ricardo Montalban got laid though? Because oh with God. a physique like that, oh, with God. the voice like that, and the fact that he's on these fantasy shows that just make certain women like just oh i fall over themselves like you got to imagine now i'm he uh, according to wikipedia ricardo montalban was married to the same woman for most of his life um and you have to imagine that ricardo montalban is a stand-up guy he just he seems like a real version of the most interesting man in the world him and julio iglesias they're yeah. good looking men they're put together yeah. they're charismatic yeah. i'm very heterosexual but these guys i could see where a middle-aged woman would just swoon they're good looking oh. guys yeah, no, but like of all the podcasts, I was thinking to myself, Gene could fucking pull this off. He's got the long hair. Like if you put some silver in your hair and uh, wore one of those jackets, like I could see you going to a goth club dress like uh, Khan in Star Trek Two: The Wrath of Khan, because he also has like that one weird glove that's happening <laughs> on his right hand. What's that about? So fun story about the glove. He was actually just told uh, by the director to have it on for mystery. And to let the audience <laughs> figure out their own theories about the glove. So again, another thing that we think is new now when we watch like Westworld and we're like, what's that mystery about? And they're like, oh, we just decided to make it a mystery. They've been doing this shit for a while, guys. Nothing's new anymore. Yeah. But the one thing as a kid I remember that really scared me was the ear bugs or the earworms, right? That fucking, that shit gave me nightmares. And it still gave me paranoia as an adult. Growing up, we had something called earwigs. Did you guys have those? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had we have every bug known imaginable to in Florida. You know this, Big D. But I mean, uh, people who haven't seen them, they, they're small. They look like, like big ants with these giant pinchers on them. And as a kid, my sister just fucked with me. She's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Those things, they'll crawl in your ears at night and they'll lay eggs and they'll actually make you go crazy. So as a kid for years I was always afraid at night I would like kind of shake my head like I had just gone in the pool <laughs> to get anything out. Oh yeah. It caused me all kinds of complexes. And, and just so people know, I I looked it up. Yes, bugs do climb into people's ears, but it's only 4 or 5 times a year that it usually will happen per hospital and it's usually like roaches will go in or small moths and they get stuck behind like the eardrum and their legs will scrape. So people start to hear this, this buzzing or humming. Uh, They have had cases where, you know, spiders will lay eggs, but it's very rare. It does happen. But as a kid, I was convinced that this happened on a daily basis. And I almost wanted to put cotton in my ears. This was a fucked up scene. Well, outside of the earwig, right? The creepy earwig, which is still creepy to this day. The thing that really bothered me more than that was David, the character David, who I guess is Kirk's bastard son, right? Or like he had a... Wow. (laughs) I mean, I guess he was told by Dr. Marcus not to come around anymore. But David's a fucking brat, right? Like, I'm I'm trying to understand what his character is. Like, if if his father has been kept from him, he doesn't really have a reason to hate Kirk, but he almost has been raised as like a scientist hippie, right? Like, is he... I, I'm trying to understand because he's very bratty throughout. He's always complaining. He's always like, mm, the military, mm, I knew they were going to do this. Mm, Captain Kirk. Mm. I mean, he's he's kind of right, though. I think David's representing the voice of like the no nukes kids uh-huh. in the 80s, where he's uh-huh. basically like, we made this amazing device that can bring life to desolate areas and improve the food supply of the entire galaxy. And the military is going to come fuck it up. And sure enough, they get caught in the middle of a, of a fight and uh, people die. And David's David's actually the most sane person in this movie. <laughs> I just fucking hated his hair. You know, he got cast 50 percent for those curls. It was just so obvious. I'm like, all right, look at the hair. Yeah. Him and Kirk look at each other like, mm, I think he might be mine. Yeah. David also looks like he deserves like he's going to be. um in in the Star Trek parody porn version, right? Like he's going to be one of those actors. <laughs> he looks exactly like yeah. that. But like this was also, um, I guess what they also teleport. And one of the things that always interests me about the teleportation is they just kind of go down by themselves. There's no, there's no wharf. There's no, I guess in the earlier Trek, there was no security detail that would go down. It was just a collection of red shirts. I don't get why they do that. And that's a problem I've always had. If you're ever going out, okay, you could have the sensors tell you, well, there's one life form. It doesn't hurt to have a security detail. 
five or six guys that are just security. I don't understand why they keep doing it. You'll be prepared if something goes sideways. Why would you let the captain, an admiral, go somewhere unaccompanied? It's ridiculous. If Chekhov and the captain had gone out with five or six guys, none of this happens because the crew of the Botany Bay doesn't have weapons. You could have immediately stopped this. So half of the shit Star Trek gets in is due to their own incompetence. Well, Kirk assumes command of the Enterprise after the ship deployed on a training cruise receives a distress call from regular one en route. The Enterprise is ambushed and crippled by the Reliant. Khan offers to spare Kirk's crew if they relinquish all material related to Genesis. Kirk instead stalls for time and remotely lowers Reliant's shields, enabling a counterattack. Khan is then forced to retreat and repair while the Enterprise limps to regular one. Kirk, McCoy, and Savick beam to the station and find Terrell and Chekhov alive, along with slaughtered memories of Marcus's team. They soon find Carol and David hiding Genesis deep inside the nearby planetoid. So we've got an ambush. We've got the remote hijacking of a ship's shields. You got the arrival at a station. You got a massacre. Uh, you've got the hiding of a terraforming device deep within a planetoid. Sounds exciting. It's not. This movie is fucking slow. <laughs> and I loved the original Star Trek. It was 45-minute episodes. And I love The Next Generation. The episodes were slightly shorter than that. And the new movies, as you mentioned, Raj, very exciting. This is painful. Like, you're in the middle of combat. The most exciting points of the movie, this combat, and, and it's slow. And the thing is that we always got to remember is, like, as we've seen time and time again, combat and lethality gets faster as the years go by you know back in the day sword fight it, it might it might take a while right now you shoot a guy from thousands of yards away or you got a drone you know uh dog fights in in world war one you know they happened over a period of time now it's like guys gonna shoot you from over the horizon you don't even get to see him before you die why does combat take so fucking long <laughs> in star trek well, that's, again, what made me love and appreciate the reboot in 2009 is J.J. answers that question. And he's like, hey, this is going to be our generation Star Trek where we're going to make it kind of cool. And you're going to see how combat is on the outside. And it goes from outside to inside to outside. There are people who are sucked out into the vacuum of space. And when they land on the planet, to your point, Big D, Sulu pulls out his fucking space sword and starts fencing because I guess there was one episode where George Takei did that, but it, it was, it, there was like real modern day combat. Now, some people who are, tr are Trek fans don't like that, but I thought it was, I thought it made the series more exciting. Now in the fucking, the most recent one where fast and the furious director did uh, the beastie boys on motorbikes. That was a little jumping the shark for me. But it a made little? me like, yeah, yeah. The first one I felt really did a good job of establishing what Star Trek needed in these instances where Captain Kirk battles David and you're like, oh my God, that's the most staged fight in the world. Who does that? Or the 60 second stall, you know, where Kirk literally puts on his old man glasses. Like how, how fucking lame is this stall tactic? Khan, like a genetically modified engineered superhuman, isn't going to see through this stall tactic that's happening. All I'm seeing while I'm watching this movie is just infinite opportunities to improve starships as well. I'm like, listen, yes. guys, pay me. I'll fix these ships for you. So a couple of things I want to just add on to the Enterprise to make it more functional in these tactical environments. A mute button would be really good so you don't have to whisper to each other. Okay, now we're going to get the phasers locked in on the target. Um, also, engineering. Don't locate it broadside on the ship. The easiest part of the ship to hit other than the saucer is the fucking body of it. And they're like, hmm, where should we put the most vital part of our ship that makes things run and generates all the power? I know right on the surface on the side. Why don't you put it somewhere deeper in the ship or I mean, underneath the ship? idiotic and then have some ordinance that doesn't require like your engine room to be running in order to fire could you imagine if uh you know if, if the u.s military was like okay you you've you, you know you've got a warship and they're like okay we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and fire at these guys like, oh sorry the power's out we can't shoot seems like a big <laughs> liability and then the biggest one of all is you see the enterprise take remote control of the reliance shields this seems like a yeah. big fucking problem 
if if you can be hacked with a four digit code, not good for security. Exactly. I'm surprised the code wasn't one, two, three, four, five, right? Like they <laughs> you know what I mean? But but they do try to explain it, which is why the script is not as bad as some of the other Star Trek movies. But listen, everybody is sucking Kirk's dick. He comes on the bridge. Oh, it's a legend. Look at Kirk. He, oh, my God. That's Captain Kirk. Did you hear he cheated in the Kobayashi Maru? <laughs> he's fucking incompetent. When they first come upon the Reliant and he's like, hmm, this is very strange. There's uh, no communications. And then Savik says, sir, sir, uh, you know, it is regulation. We have to raise the shields. There's no downside. Kirk just brushes her off and he fucking doesn't do what she says. He's just, hmm. I don't know what's going on. Why is it? Yo, Spock, can you scan to see if there's anything wrong? He's like, oh, oh, you know, nothing seems wrong with them. Raise your fucking shields. Why is everybody sucking his dick? He is completely incompetent. Yeah, Raj, if you and I were driving toward each other on the road and I saw your car and I like flash my headlights at you and you didn't respond in kind, I'd be like, something's very fucking wrong here. <laughs> I'm going to put my I'm putting my fucking shields up. This is <laughs> something's fishy. <laughs> Why wouldn't you just have the shields on at all time? Oh, well, it's a massive energy drain. Who gives a fuck? You've got this giant reactor. It seems like infinite power unless you get hit, right? No, no, no. Dilithium no, no. crystals? So, no. Listen, as a as a skilled player of the video game Artemis, <laughs> and we've been over this before during Galaxy Quest, uh, you've got a certain amount of energy that you will deplete rather quickly. Uh, especially if you're doing things like going a warp speed, that sucks right. up a lot of energy if you're going beyond impulse. And there's no fueling station anywhere nearby that we've seen in this film. So they've got to be conservative with their with their energy. And shields take up a lot of energy. Like, it's a massive drain. Well, it seems like the shields don't even fucking do anything, right? Because it just seems like it blasts right through and it kills all these people. And and then after this attack, after the Reliant leaves and the Reliant lost people too, and and then Kirk is going into the sick bay and he sees all the dead officers, and then there's that one kid that's there on the bay, and <laughs> yes. and Bones like, uh, and like I, I guess in his last breath he's like, <laughs> "Did you get it, sir?" And they're like, "Warp speed." I don't know what the fucking the interaction no, no, was. He- he asks Kirk permission to die. Basically. Oh, that's right. That's right. And then Kirk says, warp speed, sir. Like, onward no, to the said, undiscovered country. Granted, yes. Yeah, granted. But, like, did you find these, like, scenes over the fucking top? Yeah. You know, if people are like, well, Star Trek's not about the tactical. I'm like, okay, I accept that. Like, it's not about action. I'm like, okay, I accept that. Like, it's about characters and, and feelings and the way they connect. And I'm like, why do I care about this kid? So what they do is, again, this guy who was engineering, before they go out, they're like, do you want to go out on the on a cruise or whatever? And they're like, okay, Admiral, you know, give the word. And he's like, the word is given. And then they recall yes. that. They were supposed to care oh, about that. Right. But here's the thing. Like, like, the whole thing is so obviously staged. You see all the lines of this puppetry. I imagine that the entire costume was designed just so they could have a white patch on it. So when the <laughs> when the guy from engineering puts his hand on Kirk, you get that bloody handprint uh, mm-hmm. on his on the bib of his uniform. Uh, and then and then Scotty trying to like emote anguish. It was it was just amateurish and terrible. All right, no, so hold did- on. How are you guys fucking glossing over this? Let's let's lay this out again. Oh right, yeah, you have fucking Scotty who is down in engineering in the center of the ship. Mm-hmm. He picks up this one dead burn crewman somehow navigates the main length of the ship up to the bridge to walk into the bridge carrying this guy. Was that just for dramatic effect to be like Kirk? Look what you did. All right, so the. I did some research on this because I too was troubled, not so much by like, you know, the, the fact that we're supposed to know who Khan is, but we're now supposed to know who this random crew member that everyone's getting upset about. So in the deleted scenes, one of them is uh, an extended version of the, the introduction where Scotty introduces this crewman as his nephew. And that's why Kirk specifically addresses him. And that's why at the end, you know, Scotty is carrying him because there's he, that's supposed to be Scotty's replacement. His nephew is going to follow in the footsteps of him down in the engineering room. And that's why he's so upset that he died. Yeah. But God forbid, if a member of my family died, I wouldn't get on a plane to Florida, show up at Big D's house, carry <laughs> them. Like, oh, look at my mustache. <laughs> well, Khan, having used Terrell and check off his spies, orders them to kill Kirk. Terrell resists the eel's influence and instead kills himself while Chekhov collapses as the eel leaves his body. 
Khan transports Genesis above the Reliant, intending to maroon Kirk on the lifeless planetoid, but is tricked by Kirk and Spock's coded arrangements for a rendezvous. Kirk directs the Enterprise to the nearby Mutera Nebula. Conditions inside the Nebula render shields useless and compromise targeting systems, making Enterprise and the Reliant evenly matched. Spock notes that Khan's tactics indicate inexperience in the three-dimensional combat, which Kirk exploits to disable the Reliant. Okay, we talked already about Kirk being incompetent. Everyone in this movie is an idiot. Raj, as you mentioned before, Khan is a genetically engineered genius. <laughs> and I think he was very well uh, depicted by Benedict Cumberbatch in the reboot. I was like, oh, he seems very smart. Uh, <laughs> but in this case, he's like, I'm searching for this device and I'm going to torture everybody on this fucking space station until I find it. And no, we can't find it anywhere. The thing's not small. It's the size of a fucking casket. And he doesn't check the transporter room to notice that the last coordinates are exactly where they sent it. I would think if I were looking for something, I might look for the device that transports things off the base. That might be the place to start. <laughs> right. Well, Khan was originally created by the writers. And again, I did massive research on this last night. Khan was created as a an even matched villain to Kirk, right? They were supposed to be... Um, very similar in their approach. Like Khan was supposed to be like a nineties version of Kirk, right? Nailed it. Yeah. And then I was like, well, how does fucking Khan know how to pilot a fucking starship vessel? Well, it's explained, I guess in the, in the sixties version that while he was captured or held by Starfleet, he escaped and then read all the manuals real quickly. How big do you think a manual is of a fucking Starfleet de like destroyer or ship or whatever they call it? I guess he was kind of bored. You know, you, you <laughs> right. got to sit and read something. Yeah. But okay. it's obvious. They, in the beginning, we get there. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. That's a tale of two cities. Right. And that's why they're trying to show, you know, what was it? Charles Darnley. And Dar I think Sydney Dickens. What? Dickens. No, Charles no. Dickens. Charles, Charles Darnley and Sydney Carlton were the two characters who look similar, but they have different traits. It was oh, the characters right, right, tell, right. Oh, yeah, saying. yeah, look at you. So that's why they're showing that here. But I want to go back and talk about Chekhov when he meets back with Captain Kirk. This is another example of Kirk being a fucking idiot. You now have Chekhov, and they find the captain in that box, in that, like, cargo container. Mm -hmm. He tells him, sorry, sir. You know, Khan put this thing in our heads. We couldn't control ourselves. We didn't know what we're doing. Why wouldn't you immediately draw your weapon on them? And have them scanned. He told you we were in control of our mind. And Kirk is just, he's either reckless or stupid. I don't know which it is. Well, do, uh, so when they're beamed to these planets, do they only have phasers or do they also, I mean, that's the whole reason McCoy is there, right? Because they have some sort of scanner. Again, a security team would help, you know, five or six guys who could spread out in the room. <laughs> you, you could stop this. I don't know if a security team would help because when they go down uh, inside the planetoid of Regula, they've got their phasers, they got their tricorders, and they they get there and they get jumped by David, who doesn't know how to use a knife. He hits, he <laughs> jumps down and hits him with the with the handle, eh, uh, eh, shoves him, eh. and you've got like four people with phasers and they're all just staring. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> shoots him, right. and they've got they've even got it on stun. So like, if you're on stun. And you're unsure, fucking shoot the guy anyway and figure it out later. Is you just stunned him, you know, whatever. But it gave us a chance to see Shatner do some hand to hand combat. <laughs> uh, it's laughable. It was bad. <laughs> this was the first time that we actually saw phasers do something beyond stun, though, right? That was one of the only, that was one of the complaints I remember having as a kid is that they have these cool space guns, but they're always set to stun. But you actually see someone like the Captain Terrell like, kills himself with the phaser. Yeah, the, the phases were set to disintegrate people, I guess. Yeah, that was pretty cool. But but in these scenes here where they go into the space station, all I could find myself thinking and looking at was the sets. And it hit me that one of the major differences between Star Wars and Star Trek is in Star Trek, everything looks like a movie set. It looks plastic. You can kind of see, okay, that's particle board. Everything looks futuristic, but it also doesn't look real. When you watch Star Wars, one of the things they do really well is it looks like it's plausible technology. Everything has a worn look. There's almost where everything is just kind of a hodgepodge. You can see things that are put together, and it looks more real. In this, they're trying so hard, but nothing seems like it's a real-world item. Are you referring to the eye scanner, the retina scanner? 
where like like in, like in the future the retina scanner will display your eyeball and it'll take a moment to like show you what it's no, scanning I'm, I'm talking about just anything from the way doors close to these oh, just random okay. like pipes that are sitting around everything was supposed to look like the future but hey i could see that's a pvc pipe painted silver yeah it gets worse too because if you notice there's some similarities between the bridge of the enterprise and the bridge of the reliant it's the same bridge no. they shot these four months apart and they just redecorated no. No. <laughs> i could save some money there so <laughs> but but big d you know uh you were recently at the uh star wars what was edge of the galaxy yes display and some of the photos that you were sending us i'm like holy shit like yeah they have their shit together this stuff looks real yes mm-hmm. yeah i was lucky enough to get an early preview before they opened it up so it was empty it was virtually there was probably 200 people in this entire world this disney attraction looked more real so i know they had to cut some corners but come on it just I felt like I was watching Galaxy Quest. I kept thinking of Galaxy Quest. <laughs> the problem, and that's why Galaxy Quest is so great. The problem with the Star Wars and the investment that Disney is making, they recently came out with a poll that said kids are less interested in Star Wars now than they've ever been at any point in history. Could that be the biggest misfire that Disney could make? There's just some guy in the executive meetings, and he's like, I told you guys, Toontown no. was the thing. You that idiots. <laughs> Fucking Toontown. They made Toontown. They can afford to make a couple other mistakes. But no, I mean, I, it, look, I get it. Like the the fucking the kids are attitudes change all the time. But I think Star Wars is this. And I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, by the way. But I think yeah. it's a timeless thing. And they'll, they'll get their money back on it. I Like, again, I'm not a huge Star Wars fan. And I would fucking go to that. That sounds awesome. Right. Yeah. Well, mortally wounded, Khan activates Genesis, which will reorganize all matter in the nebula, including Enterprise. And though Kirk's crew detects the activation and attempts to move out of the range, they will not be able to escape the nebula in time without the ship's inoperable warp drive. Spock goes to restore the warp drive in the engine room, which is flooded with radiation. And when McCoy tries to prevent Spock's entry, Spock incapacitates him with a Vulcan nerve bench and performs a mind meld, telling him to remember. Spock repairs the warp drive and Enterprise escapes the explosion, which forms a new planet. So we keep making the comparison between Star Trek and Star Wars. It's inevitable. Everybody does it as much as you might not want to. And one of the things you see in Star Wars all the time is that stormtrooper armor. They all wear it, but it doesn't do anything. Like if you get shot by a phaser (laughs) or a blaster and you're a stormtrooper, it doesn't matter. You're done, right? I don't know what the armor is supposed to be doing. So in Star Trek, we see everybody in engineering is wearing these like white suits. They look like they've got like an umbilical cord thing and like <laughs> they're, they're a little bulkier than the regular Starfleet uniforms. And I'm like, oh, those must be for like working in a hazardous environment. You're in engineering. You know, it makes sense. Everybody's wearing those white suits. They apparently don't shield you at all against radiation. You think that if you had a ship that had a warp core that could kick out tons of radiation, you might want to have some sort of suits that you could put on that kept you safe <laughs> yes. from that radiation. Nah, we don't need that. So let me add that to my list of improvements for the Enterprise. Suits that protect you from radiation. Uh, can, can I add one more technology that we might be smart to add to these ships? When they go into this slow speed nebula chase, right? I felt like it was your description of speed two. 17 <laughs> right. knots. We're going 17 <laughs> knots. It's a really slow chase. It's supposed to be like a submarine battle. And somehow Kirk, they can't see because the screens don't work. Kirk just somehow always manages to come up directly behind Khan ship. How about we put giant windows right on the bridge? So we're not always dependent on the screen. Then someone could just stand in the window and go, hey, guys, he's over there on the left. Turn left. (laughs) We can get him. So windows. That's my new addition. Or they have all this science. You would think they they knew that they, they would be able to do this. Um. But this is where Spock does the Vulcan neck pinch. Like, and and if he's got to get out of anything, he just does that. I remember as a kid trying to do that, but also the mind melt. And while doing this, Spock is imbuing his entire memories and himself, his personality into bones, right? This is what, this is the whole reason he does the mind melt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. That's pretty quick. What is that fucking USB C? Right. How much fucking data did he transfer? It was let's terrible. say let's 
<laughs> Let's say that I am going to self-sacrifice myself for the podcast and I'm going to go into this room of radiation. But before I do, I'm going to mind meld myself uh, into uh, both of you. Could you imagine what it's like living with my memories inside of you guys? Uh, I, I would have to take you if you put yourself in Gene, he would kill himself. So That's I'll true. take I'll you take would, that for the team. You could go inside me. We'll be you fine. You Captain that. Terrell. <laughs> Thank you. I've always wanted to be inside you. Uh. <laughs> well, before dying of radiation poisoning, Spock urges Kirk not to grieve as his decision to sacrifice himself to save the ship's crew was a logical one. A space burial is held and Spock's coffin is shot into orbit around the new planet. The crew leaves to pick up Reliance Maroon crew from SETI Alpha 5, and Spock's coffin is shown to have soft landed on the surface of the Genesis planet End movie. Okay, so I don't want to sound sadistic here, but I want some realism in these in these movies. Star Wars seems to be more brutal. Like we see people getting their arms cut off, uh, people get tortured. It's it's more real. In this, if if any you guys have watched Chernobyl, right? On HBO? Yeah. Great fucking show. In there, they do a great job of showing the real world effects of radiation. I know Spock is not human. He's somehow, you know, more resistant to it. But I would have wanted to see him, you know, get radiation burned, start to blister, make him suffer. You're supposed to have this big emotional moment. Instead, he just looks like he has eczema. He's just got dry skin, like he's got shingles. Well, you told us to watch the Amazon Prime version because it's on Amazon Prime. You can, but they've they've enhanced it for like Blu-ray on Prime, and and I I only know this because I first started watching the original version, which is not as high definition. So the makeup looked better in that version than it did in the HD, where you can clearly see that it's just makeup, and it looks like like you said he has skin flakes. Sorry, Big D. Maybe we should have watched John Carpenter's Star Trek II, The Wrath of God. There's tentacles <laughs> yeah. coming out of him and shit and blood everywhere. Yeah, because it's less about the it's less about the makeup and it's more about the, the character of Spock dying. That that took a while to happen. But you know, we we've uh we've mentioned how Leonard Nimoy looked uh, that looks forever old. Uh and he actually didn't want to do this uh movie. He didn't intend to do a sequel to Star Trek the Motion Picture. Um, but they were like, listen. Lenny, baby, if you come back and do the movie, we'll give you a dramatic death scene. And he was like, cool, I'm on board. Like, I get to die? Sweet. Never have to do this again? You won't make sequels? Great. Uh, but uh, but they actually ran this by test audiences, and they had a very negative reaction to Spock's death. And so um, although the director, Meyer, objected uh, very strongly, they had to make significant revisions to kind of tone down the ending and make it more palatable for the audience. I think that's why his death scene took half the movie. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's the um, Harrison Ford situation because Harrison Ford really didn't want to come back for empire. Right. He felt like he was kind of done with it. And he's like, I'll come back if I know I can die in the second movie. Um, But like, this gives me also major respect for Leonard Nimoy because you can tell of all the actors, he's the one that has the fucking talent. He's stuck in this. I mean, it's the galaxy quest, right? He's an amazing actor that really didn't get the credit for really carrying this franchise as far as he had. No, I mean, it's absolutely a take on Alan Rickman's character, uh, Sir uh, Alexander Dane in uh, in galaxy quest. It's that, I mean, there's a reason why it works. It's because he's a practice thespian. He is uh, taking the, he lives the role, man. Like that is him. And I think he does a, a fantastic job of it. And he's the one who's asked to do the most. Everyone else gets to just be humans. He's the one who's got to be yeah. a fucking different species. <laughs> but you know, one of my complaints oh, about my Star God. Trek is it's so human centric. The, mm-hmm. the biggest compliment that Kirk gives, because he's just so fucking oblivious to the fact that there are other cultures and other races and other ways to be, is he stands over Spock's body and says, of all the souls I've encountered in my travels, <laughs> his was the most human. Because all species should be honored to be human. That's such a big thing to fucking aspire to. And then they cue the bagpipes, and I'm like, fuck this movie. Hold the fuck on. Yes. First, they got Scotty out there with his bagpipes playing Amazing Grace. Then they shoot out the fucking Torpedo Bay casket. There's a rainbow behind it, and it starts into the (laughs) score of Amazing Grace. I was like, how is this supposed to be emotionally impactful? It was comical. I actually chuckled. I was like, they did not just do a rainbow as the casket shoots over the horizon. 
I, for some reason, remember because the death came kind of sudden for me uh, of Spock. I was like, wow, they're doing this kind of some, some, you know, semi early because I thought in my memory, I remember Khan surviving like he transported himself at the last minute before he set off the Genesis device and then reappears after their guard is down with Spock's death. And then Khan kills David. I thought I remember that. I think you're thinking of Galaxy Quest. That happened in Galaxy Quest. <laughs> they transported themselves <laughs> on board and oh, they killed okay. the crewmen. That, that might have been uh, what happened. But no, David had to survive so he could have cinema's most awkward hug with William Shatner. <laughs> so he's like, I'm so proud to be your son, dad. And they're in, they're in uh, Kirk's chambers. And then they go and like Shatner's hugging him. And the camera turns to Shatner's back so you can see David's face. He's yeah. not hugging back. He's like, fuck <laughs> this. What is going on? His old man's just touching me. But doesn't David die later on and that haunts Kirk? I thought David dies by maybe the Klingons. And that's why he hated the Klingons is because they killed his son. Maybe in the search for Spock. Maybe. Which, by the way, Christopher Lloyd in Klingon makeup. Fucking a sight to behold. Someone please commission uh, Star Trek 3. <laughs> <laughs> Someone can watch that. Also, um, we, we didn't talk about it, but Khan, as he's dying, he's throwing out lines from Moby Dick. Which I thought was kind of you know cool. Again, this is the best Star Trek movie where they the the script actually gives some weight to the series. And uh, if you didn't catch that, yeah, all his the all those lines are Captain Ahab, you know, chasing the white whale, which is I guess is supposed to be the the thing that ultimately takes him down, right? Do, do you know where that came from? When they're inspecting that cargo container, right? Moby Dick is on the shelf. It's one of like the eight books. Oh, that's pretty cool. No, anyway, well, now it's time for the podcast. We break out our chat meter and give you a wipe score. If you never listened to the podcast before, Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. Five Wipes is a terrible movie. We'll start with you, Big D. How many wipes do you give Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan? I, I think I'm going to give it two and a half wipes. It's not great. It's not bad. I think it's it's average. I think they could have made it a lot better in some simple ways. They wasted way too much screen time. With the whole Dr. Marcus relationship and this is your son, if they had focused on the strength of this movie, it's that battle between Kirk and and Khan and having them Mm -hmm. outmaneuver each other. I think if you focus on that, cut out the relationship bullshit, have the battle go maybe two or three rounds. They hit back at each other. They stumble off. They flip to auxiliary power. They come back. That would have been great. In the end, the ultra charismatic Ricardo Montalban, he saves this movie. Even though he doesn't demonstrate, like Gene said, Khan's superior intellect or his enhanced strength to any reasonable purpose, other than to pick up like pieces of fallen debris and uh, or to pick up Chekhov with one hand. I think he's amazing. He's memorable. To this day, Khan is the most memorable villain in all of the Star Trek movies. Right. And I think for that, the earworm, uh, the movies, it's not terrible, but it's not as good as it could have been. I know they rebooted the story, which definitely didn't have the same impact as this. But overall, it's probably still one of the best three Star Trek movies. Enjoyable. So I think two and a half is fair. Yeah, I agree with you, Big D. It, it shows its age for sure. But this was a good example of what the cast could do for the Star Trek franchise. And I think... Again, based on the response of Twitter and based on our entire review and, and, and my thoughts last night, it's not the best movie. It's not very exciting, but it's the best of the bunch. And for that, it's it's I, I actually think it's a little bit better than two and a half. I think it's better than a than an average movie. Uh, I think for me, it's a two wiper. Um, but like you said, I would have liked them to focus more on Khan, make Khan more of a a character that you think is going to win and, and, and how are they going to overcome this like big villain that's supposed to be equals to Kirk. And I, and I feel like at at some point Kirk just, it seems like he's overpowered and was easily able to take down Khan, but all the other emotional stuff where they, they kill off a a major character. um, I think all that stuff works. And so for that, it's only a two wipe, but we'll, um, we'll see what you have to say, Gene, uh, as the star Trek, fan of the group what do you give star trek to the wrath of Khan? oh man you really put me on the spot with that intro uh raj i agree with big d ricardo montalban is fantastic as you mentioned young kirstie alley 
she's great in this movie. The ear eels are one of the most horrible things I've seen in film, and you can't shake them. I mean, I don't, I, I've, I've felt things crawling on me ever since I watched the movie. Uh, Spock surprise death, I thought was a nice touch. Uh, you know, until we until we saw the treatment of his body, but uh, <laughs> but two hours is just it's too damn long for this movie. This series had a habit of wrapping every situation up in less than an hour. And I feel like in making a movie, they just took one of those hour long situations and just stretched it to two, like without adding anything, you know, uh, the production quality wasn't significantly better. I felt like I was watching a TV show that was just longer. Nearly everybody in the movie was incompetent. And I hate when the plot is explained by people just not being smart or making mistakes that are supposed to be, you know, out of character. Again, if you're going to tell me somebody's a, a superior intellect and then they aren't, it kind of ruins it. Right. Maybe should have said he's, he's superiorly charming. He's been, he's been <laughs> genetically engineered to have a big chest and be very charming for his age. He's got some pecs on him. Right. Jesus. The jokes were hammy. That was one of the worst things for me is every time a joke was supposed to hit, it just flopped. Bones makes a joke flops. Scotty makes a joke flops. Even Kirk and Spock trying to share bits of levity flopped. And of course, nearly everyone was like a thousand years old. Again, remember, this series hit its stride in the late 60s. Mm-hmm. And you're making a movie about it in 82. And we're supposed to connect with these characters. It just it didn't work for me. So for me, um, I had to go back and look at other scores that I gave movies to really find a real gauge on this because my heart said like three. But then I looked at what I gave a three two, And I was like, no, three is too kind for this film. It is a four white movie for me. Ooh. Ooh, wow. So if we were to add four, two, and two and a half and divide by three, Gene, what does that give us as an overall shot score for Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan? Raj, the average score for Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan is 2.83 repeating wipes. And if we were to compare that against other movies reviewed here in the Pantheon of Shat, Big D, where does that place Star Trek II? So that ties it now in the 77 spot with Big and License to Drive. It is worse than Roadhouse and My Cousin Vinny, and it is better (laughs) than Flatliners and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I disagree with this ranking wholeheartedly. I feel like we should name this episode Shat the Movies 2, The Wrath of Gene, right? (laughs) Because he's... I like it. I I, I feel like for some reason the, the score doesn't work here. No, it works. I'm sorry. You know what else you gave two wipes to? What's that? E.T., you're saying yeah. this movie's as good as E.T.? Yes. <laughs> oh, you, I had uh, more it, fun with this movie. This is, ask any Trekkie. I bet they'll tell you that Wrath of Khan is, the, is E.T. level. <laughs> <laughs> Go back and watch E.T. It's not that great. We just watched it. It I is know. that <laughs> <It's> not- <laughs> I'm telling our audience. That's for the audience. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, uh, now that you've heard our chat scores, because we're recording these podcasts back to back to back to back to back quickly uh, so that uh, I can go on vacation to Europe. We're just banking these. We've gone through all of our shout outs, but Gene, uh, what is a shout out and how can someone hear their shout outs uh, on the podcast? If someone would like to hear their name on the podcast, Raj, just go to shatthemovies.com and you'll see a little slider for shout outs. Put your name in there and we'll read your name on the podcast as a thank you for visiting the website. Also, while you're on the site, be sure to see upcoming movies. Uh, if you want to help the podcast out, you can do that there as well. And, uh, you know, communicate, get back to us, uh, see our old rankings, uh, see how unfairly Raj uh, rates things and how, <laughs> how perfectly and how objective I am in my assessments. <laughs> you're, All you're, that. Like, you're, you're the Spock of the podcast. You're exactly you're so- uh, unmoved by emotion. <laughs> uh, go back and listen to Gene's assessment of... Uh, Edward Scissorhands, and you'll completely see through his facade. Perfect film. <laughs> the uh, the next movie where you can see uh, talking about the the website is uh, is also listed there. The next movie we're going to do, which is what Big D. So the next movie we're doing is from 1986. Young lovers Walter and Anna are house sitting the New York City apartment owned by Max, Anna's ex husband, who suddenly decides to toss them out. Needing a new home, they settle on buying a country estate outside the city which is available for a suspiciously low price. It soon becomes apparent why, as doors fall off their hinges, staircases come crumbling down, and bathtubs fall through the floor. The couple's relationship suffers, 
And this was commissioned by Joseph M. It was released in March of 1986, uh, and it made $55 million at the box office. Stay to the end to hear the trailer and find out what we'll be doing next. I remember that being like a big movie for my like parents. Like my parents were all about oh, yeah. going and seeing this movie because it was a uh, very adult. And I remember being dragged to this. So I haven't seen it since then. So looking forward to that. So yeah, uh, check out the the next next week's release. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're everywhere on social media, including Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram. Just follow at Shat the Movies, our Facebook page is uh is you know just search for shat the movies you'll find us there our website where you can find all the links though in case you can't find it is shat you can also email us suggestions for upcoming movies at hosts at shat you can support the podcast multiple ways via paypal venmo or shopping our amazon affiliate link we're everywhere fine podcasts can be found including itunes google play stitcher youtube iHeartRadio, and spotify be sure to subscribe and if you stop by itunes be sure to leave a five-star review that does help the podcast grow you can also check out our sister podcast chat on tv where we review television series such as westworld tebu american gods game of thrones true detective and coming up in october gene watchmen the watchmen yes i'm very excited uh, after yeah. that some of the uh some of the teasers that have been coming out and the buzz on Twitter is getting me very, very excited. So we'll uh, have that for you soon before the uh, season launches. And guys, if you're not, if you, th- if you think you're burnt out on uh, on comic book stuff, I would say the boys and the Watchmen are going to keep that momentum mm-hmm. going for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, 100%. The, um, the other thing I'm excited about is the the renaissance of Don Johnson. The the Don johnson renaissance. John Johnson? The Don renaissance. Donaissance. There you go. Well, on behalf of my co-host, Big D, Dick Eber, and Gene Khan Lions, I'm Gene. I'm Roger Roper. <laughs> See, we've already mind melded. We're we're one person now. You're I'm inside, inside me too. Great. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Be sure to join us on the next week's podcast for the following review. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. Good night and good luck. Anna and Walter are young, single, and in love. They've got good jobs. Fabulous address. futures, a magnificent new home that they bought for a song. Who says they can't have it all? It's going to be fun fixing it up. You'll see. It's gonna need some work. Five grand, five thousand dollars? That's just a deposit. A little work. When do you think you can start? Just as soon as your check clears. A little care. Do you really buy this house? Yes, it is. <laughs> a little imagination, and it's gonna be great. All the out! Hey, Mr. Fielding, don't worry about a thing. Okay, guys. money pit if they've got what it takes it's going to take everything they've got coming this christmas from universal pictures